In today's first reading, God uses the Gentile ruler Cyrus to accomplish divine purposes. When the Pharisees try to trap Jesus, he tells them to give the emperor what belongs to him and to God what belongs to God. To gather for worship reminds us that our ultimate allegiance is to God rather than to any earthly authority. Created in the image of God, we offer our entire selves in the service of God and for the sake of the world. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this day. Welcome to Zion. We really need this. We need this time of, of song and prayer. We need this time of hearing God's word. We need this time of, of being blessed with the gifts that the Lord has ready to bless us with. Uh, we, we really need this time. This time in which we will be reminded and encouraged to make use of God's gifts uh, in, in ways that bless others. We, we need this time. May God bless this time. Well, one of the blessings of worship has always been the blessing that comes from being in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ during these times of worship. We are going to continue to experience that blessing in a, and I just realized what I'm doing here, John, sorry, I had this down here. So I may just uh, mess up your sound, okay. Um, do I need to start over? Okay, no, okay, no, okay. Um, but we are, are, are going to experience the blessing of, of fellowship in a very different way than we used to experience before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic began. So as difficult as it is, I encourage you to Keep your distance uh, from one another uh, before, during, and, and after worship. Uh, in most cases these days, we can best be a blessing to others by staying away from them, if they're non-family non members or non-bubble members or however you want to, want to uh, think of that. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit will fill the gaps between us, okay? And not only my prayer, my trust is that will happen. Uh, before we immerse ourselves in worship this day and, and hear the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ, uh, I have some other good news to share. Um, within the last 10 years, this congregation has renovated and remodeled and added on uh, to Zion's building in some remarkable ways. And that's not to mention the building of the child care and the preschool across the street in the years before this. But the congregation and its leadership and, uh, and the facility planning committee and then a forward and faith committee and then with a huge capital campaign uh, worked together to envision and to plan and then to actualize uh, some major work to enhance and to uh, expand the ministry possibilities that a renewed building uh, would, would bring about. And as many of you well know, uh, this was not an easy thing to bring about in many ways. And one of the challenges was in regards to finances. So the congregation gave. And then the congregation borrowed over $2.2 million, in fact. And then the congregation gave again. And then the congregation gave. And thanks to the generosity of so many and... Uh, and, and we certainly need to mention the generosity of those who gave Zion a, um, a couple of major gifts through their wills. I can tell you today that Zion Lutheran Church, as of in the past week or so, is mortgage-free. Um, the entire building debt has been paid. And yes, I would hope you would do that. That's that is an incredible thing to think about, especially in that short time frame uh, that we're talking about. And if these were normal times, we would be gathering together in this huge celebration uh, opportunity, um, and maybe we'll do that a year from now or something like that. But for now, we say thanks be to God, and we say thanks be to you. Uh, what, what a wonderful, wonderful thing to, to celebrate, and we do. And we really do want to give ourselves at least a a moment or two of celebration, but the question immediately comes up uh, from, from folks that have, have heard this, well, what about my gifts now to forward in faith? Oh, thank you, sunshine. You were just a few, few minutes late. That would have been nice in the midst of that. 
But uh, what about my gifts now to forward in faith? Where will they go? Should I stop or should I continue uh, uh, those gifts to the forward and faith fund? Are there other needs within and through the church that need to be addressed? And we hope that these questions will be answered when you receive a mailing from the Stewardship Committee in about three weeks. Um, the short answer is that you can continue to uh, give if you so desire. Uh, the gifts can be directed, continue to be directed to the Forward and Faith Fund with the funds being used for the next phase of the building project. For those of you who are here, you remember there were boxes or phases, but they're called boxes, and box two included a canopy or a portico over the east entrance of the narthex over here. And so, so that is the next phase that is, that is being worked on now. So you can continue to give uh, towards that, that project that is anticipated. Um, and and uh, part of that has actually been approved by the congregation. Or you can, if you decide to continue to giving, you can shift uh, some of your giving to the general fund, uh, your regular offering, which I have to say is experiencing a, a deficit uh, in this somewhat difficult year. But whatever you, you choose to do, we give thanks for your dedicated generosity and your dedicated commitment uh, to the Forward and Faith Fund in this past decade. Look what it has done. Uh, and again, thanks be to God. Uh, and thanks be to God for the generosity that that uh, so many have have um, have let act within them and through them. All right. So we start our worship service with good news and we move on to more good news. That's what worship is about. Would you please stand? Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own way. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. We are people created, chosen by God, and we're washed in
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Cyrus, the Persian emperor, is the one the Lord has anointed to end, ex end Israel's exile. The Lord makes this choice so that the whole world will recognize this Lord as the only God. Persia had a God of light and a God of darkness. The Lord claims sovereignty over both light and darkness. The first reading is from the 45th chapter of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes to open doors before him and the gates shall not be closed. I will, be go, I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob, and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that you may know, from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light, and I create darkness. I make wheel and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 96, spoken responsibly. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Proclaim God's salvation from day to day. Declare God's glory among the nations and God's wonders among all peoples. For great is the Lord, and great to be praised, more to be feared than all gods. As for all the gods of the nations, they are but idols, but you, O Lord, have made the heavens. Majesty and magnificence are in your presence. Power and splendor are in your sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, you families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord honor and power. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to do the holy name. Bring offerings and enter to the courts of the Lord. We 
worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, tremble before the Lord, all the earth. Most likely in this letter is the first written by Paul. Paul gives pastoral encouragement and reassurances to new Christians living in an antagonistic environment. Their commitment of faith, love, and hope makes them a model for other new Christian communities. A reading from the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the Church of the Thessalonians, and God, and the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters beloved by God, that he has chosen you, because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and full of conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and in Archaea. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Archaea, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to Matthew, reading from the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. And I'm going to be speaking to all the children that are out there listening on the radio or watching on Facebook and uh, all the children that are, the older children that are gathered here this day, and just, um, I'm going to need some responses. So remember, all of us are children of God, so y'all need, need to respond here, okay? Get in my spot. Ha, that's good. I just thought about, you're all going to need to respond, and then I walk up here with this, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. Good morning. Today's gospel Bible reading, gospel means good news, um, and it, it's the Bible reading that I just, just finished reading up here, made me think of something that I thought would be good to talk with, with you children and, and you children about uh, this day. Um, and I've got something up here that we use almost every time, I better stand up so everybody can see, 
that we use almost every time we gather to worship together. We used to pass it around during worship, and we'll probably get back to that at some, some point. Um, but right now, these things are, are at each of the entrances or exits of, of this the sanctuary, this room in which we worship. And I'm going to tell you um, what this might be, and uh, then you're going to tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong, okay? And again, all the children, I need, need your answer so that, that you, you can tell me. Is this a hat? No, it's not a hat. Okay, okay. How about a Frisbee? Okay. <laughs> that could probably decapitate someone. <laughs> um, how about... I could say this, this will show my age. Is this a Jethro Bodine cereal bowl? No, okay, that's, okay, no, it's, it's not that, is it? How about this, is it an offering plate? Yes, okay, I am holding an offering plate, and that's especially important for folks who are listening on the radio to know, uh, now they can go back and think, okay, well, hat and cereal bowl and frisbee, okay, anyway, but it's, a, it's an offering plate. But you know, even that needs some explanation, because... What do we do with an offering plate? And I know that sounds like a rhetorical question, but this is one I'm looking for. What do we do with an offering plate? Yeah, you give your gifts, you give your offerings, you put, you put money in it, and, and okay, so that's, that's what an offering plate is for. And it's important to understand now why. Why do we encourage people to, to put money in these offering plates during our, our times of worship. And it's important that we start understanding this even at a very young age. Because some people can get a wrong idea about what this is all about. And we need to make sure that, that folks understand what this offering plate and our offerings are about. If the purpose of having these plates back there or at other times passed around to people during a worship service if the purpose is to make sure that we can pay the electric bill and keep the electricity on, that's not, we shouldn't be doing that in worship. If the purpose is to pay for the bulletins, we shouldn't be collecting money during the worship. If the purpose is to pay the pastor to, to work here, and that's what it's all about, then, then, then we shouldn't be doing that during a time of worship. This is a time and a place to worship God. We can figure other ways of getting money to pay bills if that's what it's all about. But this is a time of worship. So in worship, we sing to God, maybe not quite as loud and robustly as we used to, okay? So we need to keep that down for the sake of the health of those around us. Uh, we pray to God in worship. We listen to God's word uh, to us. We receive God's gifts to us that, that come through the word, that come through the Bible, that come through baptism, come through the Lord's Supper, the gifts of God that come to us in seeing and being with other uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. We do all that in worship. So how does the offering fit in? Well, the offering is a time to remind us that everything we have is a gift from God. And God wants us to use everything um, we have in a way that, that is befitting God's will and what God would want us to do with it. So in worship, we give to God a, a part of what God has given us as a reminder that God has given us everything and we give some of that, that in the offering plate and that gift that we give is then used for God's work through the congregation, through the, the, the larger church. It's a part of our worship. The offering is an important part of worship, as, as is every other part of worship. It's not just a commercial break, okay, now we need to pay the bills. It is an act of worship. It's a time of giving to God, giving to God's work. It's a time of remembering that everything that we have is a gift from God. Everything. All right? Okay. Like I said, that's an important thing for, for our young and old children uh, to, to realize and to remember. All right.
It's one of those mornings that I'm glad I had you talk during the children's sermon because you were so quiet in other ways. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I would have to say that there are a number of conversation topics that one should avoid in particular settings or in particular groups if you want that conversation to remain on a calm, even keel. I can think of particular times and groupings, even within my own family, when particular topics have been brought up in conversation, and let's just say it wasn't necessarily a good thing. Any of you ever experienced that in a time of conversation with other people? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, we have. And uh, here are three of those hot topics. Money, religion, and politics. <laughs> you want to move a pleasant or maybe even a somewhat bland conversation into a possible minefield? Start talking about one of those. Money, religion, or politics. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. That's how this morning's gospel reading started out. And how did the Pharisees plan to entrap Jesus in what he said? They asked him a question that had to do with all three of those things. While Jesus was sitting in the temple grounds in a religious place, they asked him a question about paying taxes to the Roman emperor. Religion, money, politics. This question was loaded. This was the ultimate triple whammy. No matter what direction his answer or answers went, Jesus was going to offend someone. And that's exactly what his questioners wanted. This was a brilliant setup. So what did Jesus do? He said that they should pay their taxes to the emperor. Show me the coin used for, for the tax. Whose head is this? Whose title? Well, then give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's. Pay your taxes. Now, it's probably not the kind of thing that any of us really want to hear. And politicians certainly know that. So we've heard it over and over again in these past months about how I'm going to lower your taxes, my opponent's going to raise your taxes. And in political campaigns over the years, we've heard some version of this kind of thing from both sides. And while there's probably something in each of us that may want to hear these kinds of promises, and we may want these promises to become more than just promises, we also realize the necessity of taxes. I mean, think what life would be like without us rendering to the emperor, rendering to Caesar through our tax dollars. I think we way too often take for granted the benefits that come from paying taxes. Roads and schools and, and police and fire protection and social welfare and social security and national defense and our court systems and our parks and, and we could go on and on and on. Paying taxes is an important part of supporting one another and of living together. As has been noted by a number of individuals over the years, taxes are the price of civilization. And Jesus says, pay your taxes. But as you and I know, Jesus' answer continues. Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. Within our Saturday evening and Sunday morning times of worship, we very often make a, a confession of our faith together using either the ancient words of the uh, Apostles' Creed or the almost as ancient words of the Nicene Creed, and we begin our confession of faith within both of those creeds by making a statement about God's creative work. Uh, today, uh, this morning, using the Apostles' Creed, we will say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And in speaking these words, we are saying that we recognize that everything we have and everything we are is pure gift. There is nothing we have 
And, or maybe it's more clear if I separate that word into its original pronunciation. There is no thing we have that we can't trace back to the one who created it. I mean, sure, there are things that we call man-made or manufactured, but even those things are just reconfigurations of the stuff that God has already created. This world, the people of this world, your very life are creations of God. How then can we help but be thankful people? And we can show that gratitude. We can show our thanksgiving to the Creator in so many ways. We can do so in the way that we live our daily lives, treating this earth and its inhabitants as creations and as gifts of the Almighty God. We, we take care of the earth. We take care of its inhabitants. And we take care of ourselves and our bodies as creations of God. And we have the opportunity every time we sit down for a meal to give thanks to God. To give thanks to God for that which we are about to eat and for those whose, whose hands and talents have prepared it. We have opportunities in our times of worship when we sing our hymns of, of praise and thanksgiving. We have the opportunity to lift up our prayers of thanksgiving. We have the opportunity to worship and give thanks to God through our, our offering to the work and ministry of the church. And a portion of the Holy Communion service has for centuries been called the Great Thanksgiving, recognizing that an ancient name for the Lord's Supper is the Eucharist. And that's the Greek word for thanksgiving. And so deep, deep down, we know that Jesus is right. We are to give to God the things that are God's. And the recognition that God has created me and all that exists brings about a spirit and a life of thanksgiving. But the temptation might be for us to just continue running with this particular line of thought and say, yes, we are to give to God, the Creator, our thanks and praise for all that God has given us, and let it be at that. But that would be to ignore the context of the question that was put before Jesus. And that would be to ignore the context of Jesus' answer. And that would be to ignore the fact that Jesus said the words he said with money in his hand. So, let's just lay the question on the table. How do we decide what God gets? You know, the church is one place where we expect to hear talk about religion, right? So, okay, we're okay with that. Religious conversation is okay here. Uh, politics, whoa, we start squirming a bit. But money, hey, you're getting personal now, okay? The defensive shields start going up. Jesus said, give to God the things that are God's. But if we're talking about money, and we are, how do we decide just what or how much that is? Within this congregation, we have tithers, those who follow the biblical model of giving 10% of their income as an offering to the ministry of the Lord. We have those who are proportionate first fruits givers, those who have established a numerical percentage of their income that they give as an offering. And, and proportionate first fruit givers may very well be working towards that 10%, that, that tithing level. Others are over that 10% figure. We have those, I'm sure, who give a particular or set dollar amount on the days that they happen to be here in worship or the day, the day in which they mail in their offering. That dollar amount may have changed some over the years, or it might be the same as it's always been, even though nothing else in this world may be the same as it's always been. I've heard a couple of remarks over the years that have led me to believe that there are some folks who view the offering as a kind of tip, depending on how good or bad they thought the sermon was that day. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. And I imagine we have those who really don't think about the offering much at all until we get to the offering time of service or they walk by that offering plate that is sitting by the entrance door and they say, oh yeah, what have I got with me that I can put in the plate today? 
it's not real comfortable talking about church offerings, is it? But you can see that there are a number of different answers to the question of just how much God or the church of God should get from us or should get from me. We need some help with this. And Jesus' answer actually gives us some help with this. When asked this entrapping question, Jesus asked for a coin. Now, many coins of that era have been recovered in archaeological digs. And sure enough, just like the coins of today, they have pictures of the heads of people on one side of them. And the coins of the Roman Empire? Well, there's the image of the emperor of that particular time when that coin was made, when that coin was minted. And so Jesus said, bears his image, give it back to him. Now here's the kicker. Remember one of the things we hear within the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible? Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Jesus told the Pharisees that because the coin bore the image of the emperor, they should give it to the emperor and give to God the things that are God's. So what is it that bears God's image? You do. And so what is it that you and I are to give to God? Our very selves. And how much of you are to give to God? All of you. Now, one might hear that statement as a statement of law. You had better give all of yourself every little bit to the Lord. And I guess that if that's the way that the Spirit needs to work within you this day, I probably shouldn't get in the way. But I really hope that you can hear this word as gospel, as good news. You have been created in the image of God. You belong to God, and together we belong to God. And together, who we are and what we do reflects the image of God. When, when this thought came to me a couple of days ago as I was preparing this sermon, I, I came over here to the sanctuary and got an offering plate just to see if, if they were shiny enough that it could reflect my image in it. Oh, shoot, it doesn't, so I can't use that, but wouldn't that have been cool? You and I are created in the image of God. We belong to God. That's good news. So start your giving thoughts and your living thoughts. Your giving thoughts and deliberations by remembering that all of your life, all of your time, and yes, all of your money are ways and means to reflect the image of God. That's where we need to start the answer to all our questions regarding our life of how do we use the money that we have and how do we give. I invite you to stand and let's sing, We Give Thee But Thine Own.
of our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into sin. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious God, you call us by name and invite us to share your good news. Send your Holy Spirit among preachers, missionaries, and evangelists. We give thanks for the witness of your servant Luke, the evangelist, whom the church commemorates today. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of praise, the heavens and all creation declare your salvation. From the rising of the sun to its setting, May the whole universe show forth your goodness. Raise up the devoted stewards of all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of all, may your word of justice sound forth in every place. Restore divided nations and communities with reconciling truth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of light, we pray for those living with pain, illness, isolation, grief, anger, or doubt. Join their voices in a new song, assuring them that you call them each by name. Lord, in your mercy. God of truth, you show no partiality. May your spirit guide the work of justices, magistrates, court officials, and all vocations of the law, that your promise of restoration may be known. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of healing and comfort, come wherever the coronavirus is struck. Be present to all who mourn their dead, all who have contracted the virus, those who are quarantined or, or find themselves stranded away from, from, from family, those who have lost employment, Bless children, parents, and their teachers. Care for and guide physicians, nurses, home health aides, hospitals and clinics, medical researchers, and the Center for Disease Control. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we praise you and give you thanks for your gift of generosity that you have poured upon so many to enable this congregation to be mortgage-free in this day. Bless the continued use of this beautiful facility, that in and with it, your will will be done. Lord, in your mercy. Living God, as you raised Jesus from the dead, so raise up those who have died in you. We give thanks for their witness, confident of your rescuing welcome for all, Lord, in your mercy. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Uh, thank you for sharing that with me from a distance so I know you are capable of this. You can share the peace of the Lord with others at a distance. Please do so.
You may be seated when you're done with that. And remember, as those who have shared, as those who have received, that's just here. There's a whole world out there that needs, that needs the peace of Jesus Christ. So may we share that out in the world too. The gift of Christ's peace is just one of the many, many gifts the Lord has blessed us with. Be mindful of God's gifts. Give thanks for God's gifts. And let us always respond to the call to share God's gifts. Let's sing together. invite you to stand. When Jesus taught his followers about prayer, he shared this prayer with them and with us. So let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Loving and nurturing God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen.
I invite you, in fact, ask you to be seated and wait for the ushers to dismiss you from the room. 